put our feet together. If you'll turn your attention up to the screen, we're all going to confess this together. Let's do that. God, you are worthy of my faithful obedience. You are worthy of my awestruck worship. You are worthy of my arms wide trust. 
You are worthy of the loss of the very thing I didn't think I could ever give up. You are my Father and you are worthy. Can you let me just pray for us this morning, Lord? We just acknowledge all the things that we know that we think we have to hold on to, that we have to keep control of, all the things that we think that we have to figure out ourselves on our own. But God, you're such a good God. You don't want that for us. You want to take our burdens. You say that your burden is easy and your yoke is light. So we just, as best we can, just try to lay our our baggage down this morning, our issues this morning. We just lay them at the, at the feet of Jesus and we just choose to, God, just take this moment to just rest and be at your feet, God, to recognize that you're here with us, you care for us. Lord, I just pray that if anybody in here just feels distracted or feels disconnected this morning, that God, you would just remind them that you're near to them that your promise is true. If we just use a little bit of faith and we just draw hearts to you that you're faithful, that you draw near to us this morning. Lord, help us to center our hearts on you, to fix our eyes on you. Can you just say, Lord, I need you this morning. I need you, Jesus.
you to sing it one more time. Teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. Stretch our hands to heaven. Let's lift our hands up this morning and believe. God, we need you this morning. We need you to move in our hearts and our lives. We need you. Stir up our heart, the Lord. Stir up our thirst for you, Jesus. God, that we say it says, if you're hungry and thirsty, he fills. Blessed are you.
back to our first love. Take us back to the beginning. We felt set free and forgiven and delivered and clean. You guys remember that feeling? You're just like, wow, I feel different. Lord, forgive us when our hearts grow cold. We feel disconnected, Lord. Remind us of all that you've done for us, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, God. Passion for you. Passion for your ways. Nothing's as lovely as you, Jesus. Nothing else is worthy of our life. If you just, anything I've said or prayed you agree with, would you just say amen this morning to that? Let it be in my life, Jesus. bless the Lord this morning by worshiping and ministering to Him. I just want you to take a couple of seconds and just greet somebody around you, man. Hug their neck. Bless them in the name of the Lord. Shake their hand if you feel comfortable doing that. Hey, if you're online, good morning. It's good to be worshiping with you. Good morning. Great to see all of you, especially after last Sunday where we had such a glorious gathering over at our future location. Wasn't that great? Had a lot of wonderful comments on that, and, but we're glad you're here with us today. Um, we've been asked by Pastor Chris to uh, share with you today. Val is going to share her testimony of what um, the Lord has brought her through over the last uh, 12 months. 
And uh, then I'll be making some comments on that. I told her after the first service, gee, you're a hard act to follow. But uh, anyway, I, I hope to be able to bring a little bit to you. So be sure and encourage me when I get up here, okay? So uh, I'm new at this. But uh, it's great to see all of your faces. We want to talk to you today about the power of your testimony. And maybe there's never been a better time than this. Because we've all got masks on our face. Uh, and people really can't see that <laughs> smile. They can't see, you know, get a read on us from what they're seeing. And it really is a time in the life of the church, the body of Christ on earth, the kingdom of God manifesting, that we open our mouths in faith Amen. and trust God to fill it. So Val is going to share her testimony. Amen. Mm. Amen. Well, let me start with the scripture. It's Psalms 27, 13. I would have despaired had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And you are looking at a walking miracle this morning. You really are. I should have been dead last year, but I'm alive. Thank you, Jesus. My journey began. Yes, give all the glory to God. My journey began really officially last August. Uh, I went to see my lady doctor, a gynecologist. Ladies know what I'm talking about for my annual checkup. And she looked at her chart and she said, last year you told me your back hurt. I said, yeah, and it hurts even more. I said, in fact, I had to go in for a checkup for a procedure I had done the year before. And uh, I told the doctor and he just blew me off, said, see you in three years. <laughs> and then it started hurt it even more. And I went to see another one and he took an x-ray and said, oh, there's some swelling. And he put me on some pain meds. And then I went to see another one, and I said, he just sent me to th physical therapy. But nothing's changed. It's just worse. She said, well, I would sleep better at night if I knew exactly what is going on in your body. And I, I thought, she cares. So she set up a CT scan, and uh, I got the results from that CT scan. In fact, she's the one who called me, not even her technician or her nurse or whomever, she said, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but she says, you have a tumor in your spine at the ninth vertebrae. You need to see a neurologist. Do you know any of them? <clears throat> I said, no, I never go to doctors. You're the only one I see. I'm healthy. I've always been healthy. And she says, well, I'll set you up. So she did. But it, before I got there, I thought, I will, Fred and I were stunned. I mean, we didn't expect that. And, and I got mad at God. And, and I said to him, God, this is not fair. My gosh, I've served you all my life. I've been a pastor's wife. I've ministered. I've traveled the world on ministry trips. I take care of this body. I eat well most of the time. And I exercise. But then I got over myself. And I went to the neurologist. And he showed us the CT scan. And I'm thinking, well, I'll go see this doctor, and he'll just cut that thing out, and I'll be on my merry way. Well, he didn't do that. <clears throat> there was nothing to cut out. He said, you're going to have to have 10 sessions of radi radiation to burn that tumor. It's cancer. <gasps> well, I got mad at God again, but I got over myself quickly again, too. And so I went through that, those 10 sessions. Uh, the pain had become unbearable, so I was on oxycodone and morphine. I mean, those are high meds that have to be in your system because the pain is terrible. And I went through those 10 sessions, and he looked at the, the, the scan when it came back after my 10 sessions, and he said, well, it stopped the growth, but you still have a lot of little floating cancer cells floating all alongside your, your spine. So I'm going to send you to my good friend at West Cancer Clinic, and he'll put you on some chemotherapy, and then you'll be fine. So I don't know if he said you would be fine. But anyway, he said something like that. <clears throat> so I said, oh, my gosh, another hoop to, draw, to go through, another mountain to climb. And, you know, Fred and I, we prayed a lot, and we cried a lot, and we prayed a lot, and we cried a lot, and we, we asked God, and then we get over ourselves and just keep on going on because we trust the Lord. So I went to West Cancer Clinic, and I met this wonderful doctor, <clears throat> and he diagnosed me. He said, you have multiple myeloma. You know, cancers all have names. I said, what is that? He said, it's bone cancer. 
bone cancer. There's no bone cancer in my, I've never known anybody who had bone cancer. There's no cancer like that in my family tree. I mean, where did that come from? God, this is really not fair. But he said, you know what? We have on staff here at West Clinic the specialist that deals with multiple myeloma. I didn't even know how to spell it. I had to go to Google and look. So he said his name is Dr. Jason Chandler. Jason Chandler. I know that name. I know that name. And I remembered his mother. She was the lady that when Fred and I first started going back to church after he got discharged from the service and we, got, we moved to Memphis to be with his family and started going to church. And she's the lady that mentored me and taught me the word and showed me how to be a Christian. She was lovely. But then, you know, we got called to ministry and went our way and she went her way. And we didn't see each other for years and years and years. And I remember there was a, 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 a family reunion at the Methodist Church several years ago and we went and she, we ran into each other again, and she said, my son wanted to be a doctor, and now he's a doctor at West Clinic. Isn't that wonderful? Well, you know, it just didn't mean anything to me. I mean, you know, I didn't need West Clinic. But when I was in that doctor's office, I looked at that doctor. I said, oh, my gosh, this is the son of my very first best friend that I had when I moved to Memphis. Oh, my gosh, and he's here, and he, he's the specialist that's going to take care of me. And I had a girlfriend, when I shared that with her, she said, that was God just kissing you, telling you that you're going to be okay. And I, that went click, click, click in my spirit because I thought, yeah, God really does care for me. He's put the right people in my path. And, you know, I want to give God glory for all the doctors and the, the nurses and the medical technicians that I have met along this journey. They have been wonderful and the majority of them are believers, and I've met some from other nations, and I've gotten to speak French with them. I mean, it's just been awesome, awesome. So anyway, I went and saw this doctor, a sweetheart. He's just been so wonderful. He just, in fact, I told him, you're just like Jesus, and he looks at me kind of strange, you know. I said, you're just a godsend. Thank you, you know, and his nurses kid him about it when I say that, you know, because they're really so sweet and special. So he put me on chemotherapy. I was taking these big old horse pills and getting shots in my gut. There's all, kinds of, there's all kinds of stuff. Cancer has so advanced in these last years. It's just truly amazing. And I really believe that God has used these wonderful people to come up with these wonderful procedures that help people live longer. I mean, to God be the glory, really. To God be the glory. If any of you have experienced anything like that. So he said, we'll do this for four months. And I thought, oh, well, four months, okay. Are you sure? I think four months will work. I thought, okay, after four months, I'll be done. Wow, I can be on my merry way. See, we always think of ourselves. Huh? We want to be on our merry way, do our own thing. But, you know, anyway, so I got on it, and he said, you're not going to lose your hair. You're not going to do anything, you know. It's, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine, you know. And so after four months, you know, I'm still on these heavy pain meds because that kind of cancer, they say, is the most hurtful, and it's true. And uh, after four months, he said, you know, your numbers, every month my numbers would go down when he'd check on me. He said, you're just doing so good. You're just doing so good, you know. But see, that, that's a God thing, too, because some treatments work for people and some not for others, you know. And I don't understand that. Why? I mean, I was walking with a dear sister. We were diagnosed with cancer at the same time. And a couple of months ago, she went on to be with the Lord. And here, I'm still here, you know. It's like, I don't understand why, you know. Maybe I'll ask him when I get on the other side one day, but maybe we won't need to. We'll see everything, and everything will be wonderful. But anyway, so he said, uh, after four months, you know, he said, let's do a stem cell transplant. I said, stem cell transplant? What is that? He said, well, we have to send you to a hospital. You can either stay here in Memphis or you can go to Nashville. You'll be in the hospital anywhere from three to four weeks or longer, depends, we're going to do all kinds of things to your body, and then one day we'll pull out your some platelets, some of your blood, and we're going to do something to it. And I, some, if you Google it, I think they clean up your blood or whatever, you know, do something to it. And then we'll we'll give you a lethal dose of chemotherapy, just one big bag of liquid stuff. I've never had that. You will lose your hair, but I've got my hair today. It's longer than my husband's. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> And I like what, um, what Charles said. He said, well, you look kind of jazzy. You're spiky. I said, yeah, I'm jazzy. I'm spiky. Okay, I'll take that. But anyway, 
And he said, uh, then the next day we'll put your, your blood back in and it should wipe out the cancer completely. He said, that's what we're believing for. I said, okay, I'm in agreement. So I did that. Um, it was difficult. I mean, you know, this was it's COVID. Nobody could go to the hospital. My husband couldn't come visit me. Otherwise, he could have stayed with me the whole time. That would have been wonderful instead of just being on the phone all day and being on... Uh, being on the line with my kids and grandkids. And, you know, there are times, you know, going through all of this, I'm going to be honest, I just wanted to die. I thought, Lord, just come get me. This is just too hard. It's too painful. It's too difficult emotionally, physically, spiritually, every which way. And my husband is, is such a wonderful caregiver. I say is because he still takes care of me. But he was wonderful. I mean, he, he, I was in survival mode. I, I couldn't even read the Bible. I couldn't even pray. I couldn't do anything. He did all that for me. He fed me physically, spiritually, emotionally, every which way. I mean, he took care of me. There are days I couldn't even walk. I mean, it's just I couldn't bathe myself. I couldn't do anything. He just did it all for me. And I just... Thank God for my husband. I thank him. So anyway, I, I did that. And uh, then uh, I was there 20 days, one day short of three weeks, and they let me out. But they said, you know, with all of this, you're going to have to be away from everything for 100 days because your immune system is totally compromised. Because when we pulled out that, those platelets, we also erased all your childhood vaccinations. Totally. The polio shots, all those DPT, all the stuff that you had to take when you went to school. And, or if you traveled to other nations like we did, you know, there's certain shots we had to have if we went to certain nations in Africa or in Asia. I mean, that's just part of it, you know. So vaccinations for me is no big deal. It's just part of life. Anyway, so I came. And you can't eat certain things that have live cultures like yogurt. And you can't eat any produce if you can't wash it and peel it. So there wasn't much to eat, really. And you had to wear rubber gloves for everything. And you couldn't touch meat. And if you ate steak, it couldn't be pink inside. It had to be well done. And who likes a well done steak? No offense if that's what you like. But I like pink. But anyway. So, I mean, th that kind of thing. And I had to stay in my bubble. And only my family came to see me. And they all got vaccinated because they didn't want to hurt me or harm me. So I stayed in a bubble. And I watched church online. And I love being, being with you all and seeing your live faces. My gosh. I mean, that's... I love people. I miss people. But, you know, I was so happy to be home. I got home. My kids all had posters welcoming me home. But four days later, after I'm home, remember, I was in a sterile environment. This is the kind of hospital you don't even get water in a cup. They give you bottles. It's so, so sterile because it's the ninth floor of Methodist Hospital on Union Avenue for people that have transplants. It's just very different. Four days home, I contract COVID. Where? I don't know. I have no idea. Back in the hospital for another week. They pump all kinds of stuff in me. I thought, well, the devil didn't kill me with cancer. Now he's going to kill me with COVID. So we prayed again and cried again. And, but I got there, and it's like I had no more symptoms. All I'd had was a temperature and sniffles. And it kind of all went away. And, and the nurses would come in and chat with me and talk with me and fellowship with me because they said, everybody on the COVID floor is half dead or on ventilators, at least we can talk to you and see you and you laugh and chit chat with us. And I had no symptoms. God just kind of took care of me. So, so that's another miracle. That, that was another miracle. So then I got out and uh, then I had to wait a bit, you know, and uh, the doctors didn't release me right away. My neurosurgeon and the stem cell transplant doctor and my West uh, clinic can cancer doctor. They said, well, we've got to do a PET scan and, a, and, a, and another biopsy of your, uh, of your bone marrow to make sure that that cancer, that ugly cancer, hasn't hidden little nooks and crannies in your body. So they did that. And the, the one at the, the stem cell transplant said, well, you are in remission. I said, Hallelujah. And my neurosurgeon looked at the, the thing. The bone in my back had grown back where that tumor had messed it up. It's grown back. He said, I don't need to see you anymore. Hallelujah. But, but I am on a maintenance program at West Clinic. They're going to check me out to make sure it never comes back. And my doctor, as of July 9th this year, he said, you are cancer free. I said, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory. Now, I share this with you because 
it's important for us to share our stories. God did it for me. He can do it for you. He can do it for you. And I want to share one more scripture, and then my husband is the preacher this morning. Let's see if I can find it. It's, it's in Acts, since we've been studying the book of Acts. It's Acts 14, 22. This is what Paul was saying. And Paul went through a lot of stuff, too. He went through a lot of stuff, as you're going to hear my husband share. Paul testified a lot. So, we are sent. Why cancer, Lord? I had to ask him that. Why cancer? We don't know. Why whatever issue you have? We don't know why. We live on this earth. Things happen. That's why we need Jesus. I couldn't have done it without Jesus. I couldn't have done it without the saints. All of you praying for me and churches all over the world praying for me and the saints and family. And I looked at my grandkids and my kids and I had to choose life. I had to choose life. Seeing their faces, I thought, no, I'm not ready to go yet. I don't feel God's done with me yet. But Acts 14.22 says, we are sent. See, we're sent. We're sent people. That's what Christians are. To strengthen the souls of the disciples when you're going through stuff, and to encourage their faith because through many tribulations. Now, I added in parentheses some other T words. You'll like this. Tribulations can be tests. They can be trials. They can be transformations. They can be turmoils. They can be temptations. They can be transitions. They can be troubles and traumas. We must enter the kingdom of God. Amen? And bless you. Thank you for listening. Well, praise God, I still have my wife with me, and I am a thankful man. We want to really emphasize the power, not only of Valerie's testimony, but of your testimony. You have a story to tell. Your testimony is about all the good things that God in Christ has done in your life. And over the course of the years, there have been many things. Some of them we forget about. But the good news is the Holy Spirit will bring them to our remembrance at just the right time. What I really want to try to get at this morning is that the enemy, especially in this day, when there is so much pain, there is so much suffering all over the world with this pandemic, not to mention all the other chaotic things that are going on. There's so much of this. This is not a time for us to be silent. This is a time for us to open our mouth in faith and God will fill it. That's the exciting thing. That's what we all need to come to faith for is that God will use me to be a witness to someone or some group of people. And he wants to do it all the time. It's the power of our testimony. Now, you might say, well, I don't know anybody would be interested in my little testimony or what God's done here. Listen, people need to hear what the Lord is doing in some other people's lives. It gives them hope for the future. It gives them faith. Faith will begin to rise. We're believing that this morning some of you heard Valerie's testimony and faith started to rise. Well, if God will do it for her, he's no respect or person. He'll do it for me. You know, the very word testimony comes from a root, do it again. That's what we're saying when we share our testimony. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. That's what we're in faith for. Our testimony is not just about us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation and all those other T words that Valerie was using, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of trouble, whatever it may be, with the same comfort with which we ourselves were comforted by God. Friends, that's a powerful thing. When you and I are silent... When we neglect or forget 
or don't take advantage of an opportunity to share our testimony of what God is doing and what he has done and continues to do in our lives, do you realize that you're bottling up someone else's healing? You're, you're bottling up and hiding someone else's deliverance. You're, you're keeping someone from hearing a testimony of faith that can radically and dramatically transform their lives. One way that we can comfort others in whatever trouble they may be going through is by sharing our testimony. Now, three times in the book of Acts, we find Paul's testimony of his salvation experience. You will find it also in a couple of the letters, I I think to the Corinthians and the Galatians, where Paul was always using his testimony. In fact, it was his preferred weapon of choice. He loved to share his testimony. I'm praying this morning that you will fall in love with the idea that God could use me to share something about what he's done in my life and that would bring faith alive in their hearts so that they can be healed, so they can be delivered, so their eyes can be opened, their ears unplugged, so they can be set free from their captivity. So that they can hear that this is the year of the favor of the Lord. Paul talks about his transformation experience all the time. In Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 19, I'm not going to read all that. It's a pretty long text there. But it contains Saul of Tarsus, later to be Paul the Apostle, His original testimony as told to Luke, the writer of Acts. This testimony would have been very comforting to the early church. After all, Saul of Tarsus was their most feared persecutor. And his testimony was powerful. My goodness, most people who heard it probably thought, Oh my God, if he can save him, he can save anybody. Nobody's law is too lost. Nobody is too sinful. Nobody is too anything. God can intervene in their lives. If he can change Saul of Tarsus into Paul, an apostle of Christ, anything is possible. I hope you'll get that in your heart. Anything is possible with God. It was wonderful for the church to learn that he had been converted in such a sovereign, in such a dramatic way. It encouraged the church. Now, it took some of them a while to believe it, okay? Because it was just too mind-blowing. They couldn't fathom it. But Paul would eventually become the premier apostle of the early church. Saul's conversion would also have been proof of the fruit of suffering for Christ's sake. Acts chapter 7 and 8, which comes before this text of uh, where uh, Saul of Tarsus is sharing his testimony with Luke. And it's being written down and recorded in the New Testament. Right there in chapter 7 and 8, we have the martyrdom of Stephen at the behest of Saul of Tarsus. As a devout Pharisee of Pharisees, Saul would probably not have defiled his hands by personally stoning Stephen. But he was obviously the instigator. He himself testifies that the men who threw the stones that killed Stephen laid their garments at Saul's feet. But rather than Stephen's death being counted just as a horrible, futile loss of a precious life, It could now be seen differently. It could now be seen as gain, as how we overcome. In Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren. Who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even 
unto death. This is how we overcome the works of the enemy. It's by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and by being willing to give ourselves away, not loving our lives even unto death. In Acts chapter 22, we have another account of this transformation, this salvation experience on the uh, Damascus Road uh, where Jesus sovereignly appears. It's this glorious light blinding Saul of Tarsus as he was on his way to Damascus with orders from the uh, uh, temple to persecute the Christians that were there. And now we find that Saul is sharing his testimony with the Jewish mob who were trying to kill him. And he added this following to the testimony. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple. See, Saul had gone to Damascus. He'd had his Damascus Road experience, this confrontation with the risen Lord. He's gone into this house in Damascus and Ananias is sent to him. His eyes are open. He's water baptized and all the rest of it. And then the persecution became so bad he was a hunted man that they had to effect his escape by lowering him in a basket over the city wall. And after he escaped Damascus, he goes to Jerusalem. That's why it says in verse 17, Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a, a trance. Now, don't, don't think that's something weird, okay? Something that somebody put him into a trance or whatever, hypnotized him. I, I, I believe this scripture here, this word for trance, is talking about those moments when we have become so focused on something that it's, it's like we are oblivious to what else is going on around us. We're just so taken up by an idea, by a concept, maybe by a revelation from God's word. That was certainly, I think, uh, the case with the Apostle Paul. He says, I was in a trance and I saw Jesus saying to me, now that's pretty revelational. I saw Jesus saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. See, that's what was on the Lord's mind. And that's what the Lord wanted to be on Saul's mind. Your purpose for living, the purpose of your salvation, of the transformation that I have wrought in your life is for you to go to those who will receive the testimony, if you will. And so I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue, where are you going to send me, Lord? They know in every synagogue I am imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing there. Here it is. By consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. But then Jesus said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Well, that's all the mob needed to hear, for it says, <laughs> and they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices, and they said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. You see, for them, going to the Gentiles was their tripwire. They couldn't handle that. It was one thing to go to the Jews, but this going to the Gentiles was another thing. You know, one thing I've discovered about sharing our testimony with other people in the anointing of the Lord, at the instruction of the Lord, just being obedient to the Holy Spirit, is sometimes you're going to be sharing with people that maybe other church folk don't think you should be talking to, don't think you should be even around, don't think you should defile yourself with their presence. But you see, that's, that's old covenant thinking. That's not new covenant thinking. Now the power of the testimony has come to the least of these in the earth. And we're to testify to them. Our testimony will not always be received in faith. I remember about this time last year, Valerie and I were uh, at a, a little fellowship in our community around a fire pit. 
And we're just talking, you know, and at one point, uh, well, let me just say the group. I, I would say that they were, what's a polite way to say this? They, they were gender diverse. I, I mean, I, I, I really didn't know what everybody was or, or what they believed they were. But nevertheless, we were there and someone, I forget who it was exactly, was curious about how a guy from Memphis ended up married to a girl from Canada. And so they asked the question, how did you and Val meet? Now, when you understand that part of our purpose in life is to share our testimony with others, you're always waiting for the door to open. And when somebody else asks the question, oh, that's a lovely door. That's a door that's just swinging wide. Sometimes I have to restrain myself or I find I want to laugh because it's like, oh, boy, this is obvious. But, uh, but uh, it does make me smile. And I realize, oh, because, you know, it's one thing for you to try to walk up cold to somebody and talk to them about the Lord. But when they ask a question... No matter how lame the question may be, no matter how, how unimportant or frivolous it may seem to you, my ears are always tuned to, oh, this is an opportunity for me to testify. And so I launch into it, and I'm, I'm just having a wonderful time. They're getting way more information about how God has worked in our lives than they had bargained for. I don't even, some of them didn't even bargain for that. But you know, it was transformational. It changed our relationships. Some of them began to confess Christ to us. Some of them started calling and sending notes when Valerie was going through all that traumatic year saying, we're praying for you. I thought, glory to God, there's some fruit. I like that right there. They're praying for us. So testimony is such a powerful, powerful thing. So I just want to remind you, Wait for it. Don't try to force it. One of our favorite scriptures has come from uh, Peterson's The Message. We're walking in the unforced rhythms of God's grace. This is where Jesus is saying, you'd probably be more familiar. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's how Peterson translates it. Walking in the unforced rhythms of God's grace. And he will open the doors. He will make the way. He will give us the opportunity to share our testimony. Wait for the question. Almost any question will do. The more we give ourselves away by sharing our testimony, the more opportunities we will have. You know, the Bible says a curious thing. We know that we have no righteousness of our own, but we have the righteousness that is given to us by God. It's his righteousness, but we are to practice that righteousness. And friends, you know the old thing, practice makes perfect. I mean, it makes it easy. It makes it unforced. They, people begin to realize, oh, is, this isn't some kind of a, a religious canned thing. This guy's just sharing his heart. You know, that was what I loved about the pastor that God sent to a Methodist church. Valerie and I had started going to because we were trying to save our marriage, not realizing, oh, snap, we need to be saved. But anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, you discover these things. But this pastor comes, and he was like, no one I'd ever been around before. He just loved the Lord. It just bubbled up out of him. It just seemed so supernaturally natural. It wasn't put on. It wasn't forced. It was just the life of God coming up in him like a fountain, like a river of living water. And it was just awesome to be around the guy. In Acts 26, verses 12 to 18, Paul shares his testimony 
of how Jesus met him on the Damascus Road. And while he's sharing it, he's talking with the Roman governor Festus and King Agrippa in Caesarea. And he includes more information with his testimony about what happened after his escape from Damascus. And when Festus had heard it all, he thought Paul was mad. Not, not mad in an angry way, but mad in a crazy way. In verse 29, Festus said, uh, Paul responded to Festus saying, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before who, whom I am also speaking, meaning King Agrippa, Speaking freely to him knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention. Since this thing was not done in a corner. In other words, he's saying, what I'm sharing with you is common knowledge. It's known. Then in verse 27, Paul addresses King Agrippa. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? <laughs> then he answers for him. He says, I know that you do believe. <laughs> then Agrippa said to Paul, and this is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. You know, oftentimes we think that the sharing of our testimony has, has been a waste of time because we don't get an immediate conversion and somebody's not like the, uh, you know, the Ethiopian on the Damascus Road. Well, you know, here's what, not the Damascus Road, but, you know, the desert road. He, baptize me now. But sometimes we need to accept the fact that we're just part of the process of God bringing someone to Christ. But if we don't do our part, there's going to be a gap there. And it may prolong their agony and darkness. And we need to be faithful in this regard. We need to trust the Lord. Verse 29, Paul said, I would to God, not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether <laughs> such as I am, <laughs> except for these chains, okay? I can do without these chains. Friends, how we present the details of our testimony, it will vary. It depends on the audience that we're speaking to. We may be speaking to the church. We may be speaking to Jews or Gentiles. We may be speaking to governing powers. We may be speaking to people who are powerless, who really have no power at all. It also depends on the situation into which we're speaking or as the scripture says, prophesying. For the testimony of Jesus, the testimony of what Jesus has done in our lives is the spirit of prophecy. Ponder that. That's God speaking through us by his spirit into the hearts and minds of others. Sometimes Paul was speaking to the church to comfort them, to exhort them, to edify them. Other times he was speaking to the unbelieving and to the authorities for their salvation. But just know this, the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance what Jesus would have us to say to other people. John 14, 26, Jesus said, but the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and will bring all things to your remembrance. Doesn't matter if you think you have a bad memory. If you are born again, the Holy Spirit is living in you, you've got a pretty good memory. You've got the remembrance of everything that Jesus has said. Yeah, there might be other stuff that you can't remember, but this is the most important thing. Can we remember at the right time what Jesus would say to this person? Think about the privilege of that. 
that God would use us as a mouthpiece. When you think about how many dumb things we say, isn't it nice to know that sometimes we get it right? Sometimes we open our mouth in faith. We are being moved by the right motive, and God speaks. God speaks into someone's life, and it's transformational. He'll bring into your remembrance all whatsoever I have said unto you. The table of the Lord, communion, is Jesus' testimony to us. It's to comfort us. It's to encourage us. It's to edify and to build us up. That's why he said, as often as you, you do this, remember me. Remember me. That's what it's all about. Lord, help us. Help us today to remember that one of our primary roles in life, one of the greatest expressions of your life bubbling up inside of us is our testimony. And that every day we meet someone who needs to hear part of our story. They don't necessarily need to hear my whole life story. <laughs> they need to hear part of what you're doing in and through me. We're all wearing masks, and I'm not saying anything against that, just so we know. <laughs> but don't let that be something that gags us, that silences us. In fact, the, the very th reason that we wear masks is to protect others. But people can't read our faces anymore. They don't know if we're smiling at them or frowning at them. They don't know whether we're agreeing or disagreeing. If ever there was a time to speak up, to open our mouth in faith, and to trust God to fill it, surely, surely this must be one of those times. So let's take our communion together this morning. I love this passage in Revelation 19. Then Jesus said to me, write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you don't do that. I'm your fellow servant, speaking of an angel here. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of of Jesus worship God worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy I believe that communion gathered around the Lord's table this is revelation folks this is the spirit of prophecy reminding us of the importance of sharing our testimony. Lord, we just thank you for this bread. We thank you, Lord, that you picked up an element that was lying there on the table. You blessed it. We bless this bread today. We thank you because it brings to our remembrance that your body was broken for us. That you were always giving yourself away. Oh, Lord, help us to be, to be more giving away people, not to hold it all inside. Be content with our own salvation. Oh, Lord, but to share your life with others. Eat this in remembrance of him. And this is the cup of the new covenant in his blood a much better covenant nothing compares to it it's established on better promises this is our covenant with Jesus this is reminding us of his testimony even from the cross even from the cross Father, we just thank you today for the gift of your beloved Son. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm. Thank you, O oh Lord God. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of your beloved Son. We receive this in Jesus' name.